of you. Um, and what we'll do is start by going through the syllabus. And uh, the syllabus begins uh, with my information. And for those few of you who don't know me, my name is Rip Langford. Uh, and uh, my office is on that corner of the building on the fourth floor. If you take the elevator to the fourth floor, there's a door right as you get off the elevator. And you open it up, and there's a classroom. And you've got to walk around to the back of the classroom, sort of like Dr. Conter's old office. And that's where my office is. Uh, there are, and if there's people there, if there's a class in session, come on in, just be quiet, and, and go through. Um, if you can't find me, call. Uh, because we have, uh, because what I do is I keep my phone forwarded. So if you can't find me, you can, I don't bring it when I'm lecturing most of the time. But other than that, you can call me and, oh yeah, I'm down in the thin section lab. I'm hiding out in the library. I will come take care of you, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you know, I'm not hard to find. I am hard to find by email. If you, if you email me and expect to have a reply in an hour, don't. <laughs> my uh, email is broken. My UTEP email is broken has been broken. It, it about too. one out of every 10 emails never gets to me. And so I don't rely on it and I don't. Mm -hmm. And so it's been that way for about two years now. since they upgraded the system. Mm -hmm. So and anyway, so so call and use your voice. And I'll be happy you can call or you can text too, but and and I'll get back to you, but um, the email and I will usually get back to you by email. But if I don't, just realize your email never made it to me. Yeah. What do you prefer to be called, Dr. Langford? Or Rip, Dr. Langford, Rip, Dr. Rip, whatever you, <laughs> whatever you feel like. I'm easy. I'm not a, I, I'm not a uh, proud man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, I, I don't worry about that stuff. Whatever you're comfortable with. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. My phone number is here. And it's uh, my office number is 747-5968. Uh, that, and it does forward to my cell phone. Got email, office hours. Office hours are right after the structure class because I figure that's the easiest time for you to get me. And then uh, Thursday, 2.30 to 3.30. And there are going to be a few Thursdays. No, let me think. No, I'll be here all three. So don't worry about that. Um, okay. Questions? Okay, goals for the class. So here's, here's why do you take, if you read your new book, you'll say, oh, that's the other thing. Book, different book this semester. I changed books. I've been using the other one for a long time, and I got sick and tired of it. And so here's your new book. I'm not sure of all the different, I bought mine hard copy, so I haven't checked into all the digital various arrangements of buying a digital copy and whatnot. But, it's Sedimentary Geology by Prothero and Swarov. I've been through it enough to see it seems to be a little more clearly written than the other book I had and uh, has all, this, all the good information. So I, like, I decided I liked it a little better than the book I've been using. Would you find that in the... It's in the bookstore. Um, you know, you can also, I'm sure it's by... It's not you. Uh, it's not you. Freeman. I'm sure it's my it's some too, sort of looking. digital online thing. I just I haven't checked into it. There's one of those things on the to-do list that never happens. So um, if you guys come back Monday and can tell your classmates uh, the good deal you got, you can figure out or talk amongst yourselves and find out what's a good deal. Um, I'll be happy to know what's the best deal for you guys. I know these books are insanely expensive, um, but... They are useful. I still use my every actually for years and years. I still use my I still use my old structure book from when I was back in uh, undergrad. Okay. So what do you what are you going to learn in this class? Well, sediments don't make up much of the world. They're or much of the earth. They're that little skim on the top. And so if you look just at the continental crust, sediments make up or Oh, 10% uh, 
or five percent of the total volume of the Continental Crust, but they make up about eighty-five percent of what's exposed on the Earth's surface. And so, when you look at the Earth's surface, that's what you see. And sediments host aquifers for groundwater, petroleum reservoirs for oil, coal a lot of the metal resources, gravel, sand, most of the resources that we extract as geologists, we deal with sediments. Most of the environmental problems we deal with as geologists occur in sedimentary rocks. And so that's why it's important to know. And most geologists end up working with sediments. That's why people do this. Anyway, um, and so what I'm going to teach you to do is first to identify the, the first thing you'll do, and we're going to, I'm rearranging the class a little. We'll do plastic rocks, and we'll do identification and description of plastic rocks, and we'll come back and do the same thing with carbonates later in the class. And uh, we're going to learn to identify and describe a rock and classify. So, oh, that's an sandy conglomerate with, uh, and it has very fine-grained, well-sorted, well-rounded sand containing uh, climbing ripple cross-stratification and scolithosporus. And in a few weeks, you guys will know what all that means. And you'll, you should be able to fill in a field description of a sedimentary rock. And we're going to start, sediments, unlike a lot of other rocks, are not just massive things. So you start off with a simple hand specimen. And we'll just start with sand grains, identifying additional sand grains. And then we'll work up to a little block of rock like this. What are the features in it? What's the bedding like in a sedimentary rock? And this, we'll just keep stepping back. And throughout the class, we'll keep stepping back further and further, looking at bigger and bigger pictures. And that's where these next things come in. A stratigraphic section is where you measure, and we're going to do this a week from Friday. You, will, you measure a section up through the rock and describe the rocks in that section. And it's, it's the sort of primary data for sedimentary geology. And then you correlate uh, stratigraphy. Stratigraphy are the layers of rocks and how to chase layers of rock. As geologists, the thing you'll do most is correlate stratigraphy in the subsurface. That's why they pay you the big bucks, is that you can imagine what's going on under the ground. And you've got a well here and a well here. And somewhere in between is a pollution plume. And you can see how those layers of rock hook up so you can see which way the pollution is going to be moving. And that's, that's really why they end up paying us the big bucks, is that ability to imagine and put together a picture of what's under the ground below us. Hmm. Um, you'll also learn to identify depositional processes, the things that happen as sediments are laid down. And those explain the environments of the Earth. And one of my big things is I do this through understanding the physics of sedimentation. And don't let the physics scare you. I'll make it easy. It'll be fun. And uh, yeah, and I got depositional environments repeated. Depositional environments is basically what the Earth used to be. And this is important because this controls how the layering of the rock works. And if you understand this, you'll know how those layers are shaped. And uh, that's, that's it. And then this is sort of a review of that, you know, that I sort of, I want you to start by being able to look at a rock and take that rock and go back to what environment it was deposited in and project that away and what should happen to the same. OK, questions? All right, we will have a lot of this class um, is I'm, I'm going to try and restrict my lecture. And more than ever before, I'm going to try and mostly give you problems, have you guys do the problems on your own, and come to me with questions. 
because with these little 50 minute lectures, we don't have enough time. So come to think of it, that clock is broken. And I'm almost done with my time today. So, uh, try to keep that out. So anyway, uh, so I'm gonna have, there's a, gonna be a, there is a Blackboard site, and I'll have lots of little quizzes for you on there. The book, you really are gonna have to go into the book and study it on your own. And I really want you to, anything that confuses you, come to me with questions about it. Um, we're gonna do a lot in the laboratory and in the field. And so the big things are learning the, the, the subject material in the class, learning the practical, and we're gonna start on this on Wednesday. It's a lot of just practical techniques. Instead of learning the official definition of a medium grain sand, you guys are gonna look at enough sand grains that you can pick up a, a rock and say, oh yeah, that's a medium grain sandstone. Um, and then as we get into the class, we're gonna build, every, class, every lecture builds on itself, so eventually you're gonna be solving problems in the field. And this semester, you're gonna finish up with a research paper that's gonna be based on a field problem. And uh, the way I have it is there are four exams. Those four exams are gonna include a lot of practical stuff from the laboratory. So it's not the lab. Oh, by the way, I don't have it in the syllabus, but it's important. I don't give a separate lecture. The way this class works is it's all blended together. They made me separate the class from the lab, but the class and the lab are, are really blended together. So whatever grade you get in the class will just be duplicated in the lab because what you do in class and what you do in, in lab are so intertwined. There's no real way to separate them. Um, anyway, so four exams. Each exam is 15% of the grade. And uh, each exam will cover one section of class. So the first exam is going to cover uh, identifying and describing plastic rocks. And actually, because I rearranged the class, the first part of physics will flow. And then the second exam will cover the rest of the rocks. The third exam covers depositional environments. And the fourth exam covers specific physics. And then uh, the labs and the field projects will add up to 25% of the grade. But, and then the last 15% is going to be the final project. And we're definitely having a final project this year. And there will be an optional final exam. How did I do that? There will be an optional final exam uh, in case you totally blow one of the exams and you want to improve your grade. But that's optional only if you want to do it. OK, so before each class, read the topic. And today's assignment for tomorrow is to read chapters 1 and 5, which are on the, is the first part of describing. Is the first is an intro to the class, and the second is describing sedimentary rocks. So by Wednesday, we should have that down. Um, we'll keep test day. The actual test day will be flexible. Uh, I, I usually try to do it on a Friday, so we're not pressed for time. And that will depend on field days and things. Um, we will have two three-day trips. They are in the schedule. They're both in November or wait. One is, I hate to do this to you, but it, we're leaving on, uh, um, what's it called? Halloween. <laughs> so we're leaving on Halloween morning and coming back the second, and the next is mid-November. And they're both three days long. The first trip will be up to northern New Mexico. The second trip will be up to... And that's one of the required labs? Yeah. What about the people with kids? You that can bring, I uh, know, I know. I mean, no, I mean, that, like, that, that's horrible timing um, <laughs> for anybody. Yeah, we can give it a what? Do we need it to do this every time? 
I mean, I know there's several of us with kids. With Dr. Pavlis, and we might be able to. It pushes, it would push it back. It would make it um, cold. You haven't been up at. <laughs> you say that now. Um, but, and it would make for, and it would make for two straight weekends of field trips, which is, is a lot. I can tell you. I've done that before. Um, we, we, Dr. Pavlis and I, I know, we know, because yeah. I have kids of my own. Yeah. And, and we consider changing it. Uh, we can't do it. We, we tried to fit it in, but this fall, what with, uh, the, uh, you know, 100 year celebration and all the extra stuff for that, plus Dr. Pavlis is in my commitments. It's uh, October is really awful. Um, anyway, we will consider it, uh, but. Uh, How I long is that trip? That's a three day trip? Th three day trip. So is it leave potential anyone could leave? Sunday evening. Okay. Would it be possible for a group to leave the morning after Halloween? No. No. Okay. Saturday through Monday. Um, well, we do it Friday through Monday through, through Sunday because that's when we have. It. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to be missing classes. And we hadn't, you know, we usually don't schedule it that way because okay. yeah. we don't want you guys to to miss your other classes. Other professors can be mad at us when we do that. We'll we'll talk. Yeah. Sufficiently considered the whole weekend. That's all. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and we could yeah. do it the next week, but I, you guys will be pretty doggone tired after. I think most of us would probably prefer two weekends of field trips than, or at least I would. I, I don't. Yeah. That, that, just, that was, was two, a three days. Or actually, let's keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, no, I, and I'm not, uh, we'll talk about that. Okay. It, the yeah. thing is, it has to be with structure, too. Cause yeah. So yeah, yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll tell Dr. Pavlis I've had resistance to the being gone on Halloween. My wife always hates me a whole bunch when I'm gone on Halloween. <laughs> um, anyway. Oh, the kids would hate me a whole bunch. I used to do that. What, uh, what was it? There's a bunch of supplies. Oh, that would have been great. Um, a lot of these have changed. I for sure would get a couple of small protractors. Uh, you'll need them for structure anyway. Most of this will overlap with your structural geology required materials. Uh, a sharp mechanical pencils and a field notebook are just standard geology stuff, so you can write neatly in the field. Uh, rulers with metric scales for making stratigraphic sections and maps and things like that. Uh, a marking pen, uh, you don't really need it. It's, it's for uh, collecting samples. And it's a good thing, just in general, every geologist should. Marking pen is like a, a Sharpie or a marks a lot. Something that you can write on a rock and record information. You know, this is sample RL14 dash GB dash six. And um, it's so that you can associate a sample with a location and a description in the notebook. That's where you've got it. Uh, colored pencils are massively useful for this class. Uh, and uh, I usually, and again, also, they will be essential for field. So you might as well get some now. I like uh, the color erase ones because they uh, it just work a whole lot better. They're more expensive than. You don't need a, a huge set. You just need six or seven good colored pencils. Uh, water bottles for being in the field. Hammer. That's about it. Oh, and calculators. And you're going to want to bring your calculator not. You want to start bringing your calculator to class day because we do a lot of in-class calculating. Scientific. Scientific. You will be. Doing a lot, you a lot, you end up with a lot of things that are you know sort of minus fifteen, and so on basis, <coughs> it has to be able to do that. Doesn't have to be too fancy, but it does need to do square roots and square edges. Um, online it says that we also need graph paper. 
I gave up on the draft paper. Okay, so no <laughs> yeah, I, I provide draft paper. You can't buy draft paper anymore. It's printed off. It's anymore. hard. So I, I now provide draft paper. Okay. Uh, that's it. Okay. Um, so here's the parts of the class. We already sort of talked about that. Um, I've rearranged this to a certain extent. This now falls after the physics of flow. Um, the carbonates and other sedimentary rocks because that's the way your book flows, and I thought I'd experiment with that. Uh, <coughs> I'll cover you for time. 9.05. History of sedimentation. So sedimentology is a really, really new field in geology. It's really young. So before 1950s, the real fields were stratigraphy and paleontology. The people would sit there and argue about how this fossil hooked up with this fossil and how this layer of rock hooked up with this layer of rock here. And they would argue till the cows came home. Um, but there was no study of the actual sediments at all. And the interesting thing is most stratigraphy is now rolled into sedimentology and there are very few universities now that still teach paleontology. Um, beginning in 19, the 1950s, people started studying the uh, physical proce processes that can be reflected in rocks. People started looking at rivers, say modern rivers, as analogs to what they were seeing in the ancient. So they'd look at the Mississippi River and then try to find an ancient example of the Mississippi River. Or they'd look at uh, rocks and then say, ah, where, where today can we find that? And in the 1960s and 70s, people started describing and classifying sedimentary structures, which is going to be sort of the second topic of this class. Um, the, uh, and using those structures, they would actually go to modern environment find what was going on, find the structures the modern environment was making. And then they would take those uh, modern environments and use those as models for ancient rocks. They created what are called facies models that were this column of rock is the, in, if we go to the modern Platte River in Nebraska, it's making, if we took all the features we see and stacked them up, it would make a column that looks like this. So that's the Platte River model. And then they would go to some ancient rock and say, my ancient rock is like the Platte River, except, and the problem was, is they ended up with 67,000 different models. <laughs> it uh, kind of went nuts. And the other thing that happened in the 60s and 70s is people discovered limestones. And uh, the place, uh, that you really had to go to study limestones was the Bahamas, which makes the most popular field to study in geology. <laughs> and it was really, yeah, keep everybody, I want to do my field work in the Bahamas. Uh, Dr. Lin in our department is working in pretty places like that today. If you, if you want to be a good field assistant, go find Dr. Lin. I think he's working, he's working in the Caribbean. Anyway. Uh, in the 1980s, there were sort of two schools that ar arrived. The uh, first was um, using modern analogs and models. And there was a guy in, in University of Colorado named Walker who came up with the idea that uh, you could basically create this, this model and, and apply, OK, this rock here is like this model here. And it was using modern analogs and models to do it. Uh, another group uh, led by a fella uh, named J.R.L. Allen out of London uh, started studying sedimentary processes and the physics that controls sedimentary geology. And uh, this is the one that I use. And this is the one I'm going to teach you. I'd say um, in the last 10 years, uh, this sort of way of studying things has become much more dominant. It used to be, I'd say, more than half the sedimentary geology teachers would teach this one here, but we've, we've now gone to where looking at physics and looking at, at processes is the way we study things now. 
uh, in the late 1980s and 1990s, so this is, you see how young this whole field is. Um, most of what I teach you, they didn't even, didn't even exist when I was an undergrad. And um, in the late 1980s and 1990s, we came up with the idea of sequence stratigraphy, which was a new way, instead of looking at rocks as layers that you would connect up, we, instead of mapping those layers of rock, we started mapping the erosion surfaces that separate the layers of rock. And it, doing that, and not trying to connect up layers, and by doing that, it was sort of like one of those things where you look at the picture with all the dots, the colored dots, and all of a sudden you see a picture of a horse. When you do this, the sequence stratigraphy, all of a sudden, all the rocks fall into place, and you see the ancient landscape, an ancient environment, and all of a sudden, everything falls into place. And it, it really is like, oh, I see it. In, in a lot of big outcrops now, I can walk up to and, wow, there it is. And I, I never could do that before uh, the late 1980s, when suddenly this new idea came. And now, in the 1990s and 2000s, we've gone back out and taken these new concepts we have and applied them in conjunction with geophysics and hydrology, the influence of living organisms, and uh, diagenesis, which is how fluids flow through rocks and alter the rocks, and then how uh, the Earth's surface and the sedimentary rocks interact. And it's, it's uh, been incredibly, uh, especially starting in about 1970, these last uh, 50, 40 years have just been an unbelievably productive time in this field of geology. So, questions? Okay, so here is the first part of the class, right here in these two slides. And uh, this is pretty much what you guys will see in chapters. How are we doing for time? We're 10 hours. Um, this is pretty much what you guys will see in chapters one and five. He, he starts off with an explanation for why sedimentary geology is important and what is it is. And then in chapter five, he really starts talking about sedimentary uh, particles and textures. And we'll get into this on Wednesday. I'm gonna have a lab set up to you that'll hand down on Wednesday. It'll be a do on your own lab. And uh, the first thing is, is sedimentary rocks are formed of three, well, four basic things. There are grains, and grains are particles that have been moved around across the Earth's surface. Uh, there is cement, and cement is the material that glues rocks together. And you sort of see these black lines that are gluing this rock together. Um, and some rocks are made entirely of cement. It's just crystals that glue in the rock and replace whatever was there before. So there's nothing left but cement. Um, then there's pores. And pores here are showing up blue because they filled them with blue epoxy. And pores are the holes left in the rock. And then finally, there's matrix. And I don't have a good period picture of matrix here. Matrix is if you have, let's say, a, a gravel, and you've got silt from a river that trickles in and fills in the gravel. That is the matrix. It's basically much finer grained material that fills in amongst the, the larger grains. Questions? Everybody okay on this? So grains, matrix, pores, cement. Got it out of the way. Okay. Might as well keep going for a little. Let's see. I'll give you give you about two, three minutes and then we'll move on. The first thing that you guys are gonna see is the is when you go there we go so here's here's matrix 
It was drained to pores. Don't worry about that. I'm going to come back to it. Um, so what we'll, I'll remind you of, and we'll start with, with our first lab on Wednesday, is the concept of size. If you think about it, if you look at this rocks here, what's the, what's the size of that? If I want to give a number for that. What number do I give? <laughs> I got some big stuff. I got some smaller stuff. I got some really small stuff. What's the size? There's no scale. How can you make a determination? Yeah, that's it. Is uh, oh well. Let's say that's exactly one millimeter. I mean, but even even if you knew the scale, how do you put a number on this? Oh. How do you put a number on the Beijing hole of Ruth? Okay. <laughs> That's, I was looking to see if it was something uh, geological that I needed, like Dr. Tablas would need for later. It looks like they were having a seminar in here or something. Uh, it looks like somebody ran. Oh, there we go. And anyway, yeah, so you have big things and little things. How do you describe a size? And you can imagine doing the same thing with that. This is uh, sandstone. You can imagine doing the same thing with just sand. I go up to a, a river and I scoop out a handful of sand. I've got some little tiny things. I have some big things. I have some middle-sized things. What's, what's, the, what's the size? Well, typically, we in geology just calculate the mean, the average grain size. And the way we would do it here in a thin section is you would actually go through and randomly have your pointer, your crosshairs of your microscope stop and you count about 300 points and you would get, uh, you would measure using a, a vernier the, the size of each grain you fell on. And you would end up with a curve that shows the sizes. And what you would find is you have a few things that are really big. A few grains that are really bad. Well, actually, no, I'm bad. You have a few things that are pretty small, and a few things that are a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger. And then at the high end, at the coarsest grain, it would suddenly cut off. And it would give you a size distribution that looks like this. So if we calculated an average of all our grains, it would fall something like that. Oops. That's not what we want. In fact, if you calculate an average, here, let me turn on the lights. Can you guys in back see that okay? Okay. If we calculate an average, does anybody here have statistics in the environmental science lab? Mm -hmm. So can I do statistics on that? Mm -hmm. Not normal statistics, can I, right? I'd have to do some different kinds of statistics. Normal statistics only work. One of the assumptions of doing statistics on things is that you have a bell curve. Mm -hmm. You have a nor what's called a normal distribution, meaning there is a mean, there's an average, and things go out equally from both sides on it. And so the first thing we have to do to get a number on this is change our distribution from this to that. And in order to calculate an average size, we therefore use um, what's called the phi scale. The phi is that Greek letter. Mm -hmm. It's spelled in English. P-H-I. It's a, a small, it's the small f in uh, in uh, Greek, in the Greek alphabet, and in G, I don't know why, in the, in the fraternities and sororities, for some reason, they call this phi, but in geology, we call it phi. And I have no idea which is the correct one. <laughs> anyway, um, phi transforms, it just is, works out, and was designed to transform these log normal curves 
into a distribution that we can calculate an average in and get an average for inside time. Uh, by the way, how do you calculate an average? How do you determine an average with just sand? Well, normally, what we used to do is we, and still most people do, is we get a big stack of sieves and we pour the sand into the sieve and we weigh what catches on each sieve. And so we end up with classes hmm. of grain size that show, if I did it in terms of them, that show the, the distribution of different sizes. And again, we can fit a curve to that. Um, but what we do is we take our grain size, so the grain size in P is equal, let's see, let me get this right. Yeah, I'll start with, let me start with it the other way. The size in millimeters is equal to T to the minus Or phi, the grain size in phi is equal to the logarithm base 2, this is why we're going to need calculators, of the size in millimeters. Except because of the negative, it's not just the logarithm, it's minus the logarithm base 2 of the size in millimeters. So the negative of the base 2 logarithm of the size in millimeters. This is why scientific calculators are one reason you find scientific So, this seems annoying and complicated, but it ain't so bad. Um, and let's see, how am I doing? Oh, time. Okay, we'll stop there and we'll, because I'm going to give you a break so you don't have to run straight in the set. I mean, straight.